Luke 18, Luke chapter 18, turn there in your Bible. The title of the message today is The Problem with Pride. The Problem with Pride. And as you can see, we're going to be looking at verses 9 through 14. Uh, we're concluding a series called More to the Story. And um, hey, I want to encourage you to not miss the final. We only have three more nights of movement after this, by the way. So um, lean in. And because here's the deal, what we're going to, what we're going to hear is in December or beginning of January, we're going to be like, oh man, we took a break on movement. When is it coming back? We missed it. So I want to, if it's you saying that, be able to look at you and be like, well, I understand. At least you were here for the last three weeks of it. So make it a priority. Be here. I know there are a lot of things going on, but we want to end strong going into the holidays. We're going to end with a series called Bad Company starting next week, Bad Co., and we're going to talk about friendships. I've got an awesome video with some of your peers that I can't wait for you to see as we talked about that. But we're going to finish tonight this parable series. And the final parable is literally called the Pharisee and the tax collector. Now, very similar to last week. I know last week, at least for me, seemed like light years ago. But last week we talked about two guys, uh, a rich man and Lazarus. And tonight we also talk about two guys, two uh, men in the story. But the difference between this one and last week, if you remember this, Actually, let me just ask, what, what did I tell you about last week's parable? Anybody remember at the very beginning? Anybody remember? Just curious. Yell it out loud. It was based on a true story. Thank you, Luke. Great job. Based on a true story, right? This one is not a true story. This is a parable. How do we know that? Because at the beginning of it, it says, Jesus told this parable. Pretty simple. All right, so let's start in verse 9. Verses will be on the screen. Let's read it together. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and look down on everybody else, Jesus told this story, made up story, parable. Two men went to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this other guy who is here, the tax collector. I fast, which means, if you know what fasting is, fasting means to give up something for spiritual reason, to grow closer to the Lord because you're walking through a season or trying to make a decision or really just want to grow in your faith. It's a very spiritual practice. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get, meaning he also tithes. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, rather than the other, now this is Jesus talking, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exhausted, exalted or exhausted. God, thank you so much for your word, I pray that you would speak through this moment tonight, that we would leave here changed. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, here's our key truth. I want you to see it on the screen. Our key truth is the issue of pride is at the core of every evil heart. If you're taking notes, I give you a key truth. The issue of pride is at the core of every evil heart. This verse or passage is about two things, pride and humility. And so I think if you're a believer and you know Jesus, you would probably agree with me that one of our common sin struggles, that most of us would stand up right now and say, yeah, in some way, shape, or form, I've struggled with that. I would argue, and you'll hear later, that we all do in some way, shape, or form, is pride. This passage is about a man who had serious pride issues. Another man who knew what it meant to be humble. So my argument to you today my truth is this, that the issue of pride is at the core of every evil heart. So what I mean by evil heart? Evil heart is who you are in your nature. It's who you are sinful. It's who you were before Jesus changed you. It's who we revert back to when we are out of God's will or not walking in the spirit, right? We don't have an evil heart once God has changed it, but we tend to go back to those ways. And pride is at the core of every single one of those. You can literally look at every sin example in the Bible and pride, the pride of life, is in there some way, shape, or form. 1 John 2.16, listen to this. Another verse in the New Testament. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, 
and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. So right here, John says, listen, y'all right here, there's three things that every person struggles with, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And I wish we had time to break all three of these down because every sin can be traced back here. But this is a struggle for us all in some way, shape, or form. Some it's more, some it's less. But tonight, I wanna talk about the problem with it. Because the pride of life right here means you're elevating yourself. You can literally put, instead of pride of life, pride of your life, pride of my life. It's not from God, it's from the world. It it means it's without God, so therefore it's evil. The world is evil, so at the center of the evilness is pride. So so what do we know? We, We know that in our flesh we can be prideful people. Here's here's what I want to do. I want to break down this verse, and I want to give you two truths that I believe can help us understand the problem with pride and how to address it. Number one, if you're taking notes, truth number one, pride is spiritual blindness. So if you're looking for a definition out of the box or outside of the box for pride that you probably have heard about a lot if you grew up in church, I think this is probably one you've never heard before. Pride is literally, I'm not blind, but, but, but in order to act like I'm blind, I need to cover my eyes. And so let's, let's close my eyes, right? Pride is being spiritually blind. You, you can't see anything. I mean, I don't know about you, and if you know somebody who's blind, but I think blindness could be one of the most difficult things in the world for someone to deal with. I, I would rather lose most of my other senses than my eyesight. And so if you think about pride being spiritual blindness, that's serious. Let's look at verse 11 and 12 again in this number one guy, this Pharisee. The Pharisee stood by himself at the temple where you went to church, okay? You came to church today, you're here, and you're here to worship and do what this guy did. And so he's praying, and he says, God, thank you that I'm not like the other terrible, bad, evil people you don't like the robbers, the evildoers, the adulterers. And then this guy gets personal. Even the tax collector, who I imagine in this moment, he literally points to. Or maybe it's imagery in his mind. He's like, you know, that guy over there, God. Thank you that I'm not like him, who I happen to show up with at the same time here at the temple. And I really don't want to be seen with this guy because he doesn't live like you, even though I do. How do I do that, God? Well, I fast twice a week, not just once. I do it twice a week. And I give my money. So you see this character, the Pharisee. And here's what we know with Pharisees. If you go look at the Bible, two things. The outside was perfect. So if you're looking for the Christian, you're looking for the holy man of God, that was the Pharisee. They walked around They were very priestly. They were very orderly. They were very pastoral. Like it's what you would think of as you think of like an old school pastor, like just strong Christian on the outside. But on the inside, we know they were sinful. How do we know? Because Jesus said it over and over again. Another test for the room. What did Jesus call the Pharisees multiple times? Anybody know? Whitewashed tombs. What does that mean? Outside. You're whitewashed, you're pretty. Somebody's painted you, looks really good. On the inside, you're a tomb. You house dead people. You're not living. It's pretty dark that Jesus says that to the Pharisees. Who does that remind you of? Well, it reminds me of many Christians today. It reminds me of many people who in the church, in our faith, claim to be Christian, yet don't live like it. And that's what you saw with the Pharisees. You see it right now in his relationship with God. What what do we notice? He's standing alone and praying, meaning he's very spiritual. He compares himself to the world. He declares to God, he says, God, I am righteous, I am good. You ever done any of those things before? Have you ever compared yourself to the world and said, maybe I'm not as bad as them, so I'm doing okay? God, do you see what they did? God, did you hear about that? 
Can you believe that's what they're wearing or what they're doing or what they're saying or where they went? God, I need to remind you. I don't know if you felt this before, but I told God, hey, just a reminder, God, here's everything I'm doing for you. Because we have this desire, this need to prove to God our worth. And I believe the Pharisees were battling with this inner demon, this inner voice that was saying, hey, you need to prove it because you're really not. So here's what I want you to see about the Pharisee. He was spiritually blind. He couldn't see. He couldn't understand. He was spiritually blind to the truth. And he points his finger at the tax collector. Do you want to know whether or not you're spiritually blind in any season of your life? Do you spend more time pointing fingers at other people than you point at yourself? I'm not saying we need to be hating on ourselves all the time. But how often do you look within before you look without or out? Those who are spiritually blind typically miss what's going on in their own lives. And this Pharisee was missing it. Let's look at the next guy. What did he miss? Truth number two. If pride is spiritual blindness, humility is spiritual awareness. Humility is spiritual awareness. That word awareness means that you are alert. You know what's going on. You are, all of your senses are intact and you're like, hey, I'm in the zone. I get it. I'm alert. I'm focused. He was spiritually aware. Verse 13, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look to heaven, but beat his breast or his chest and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now we can read that and be like, what is this dude doing? That sounds weird. He's literally in agony on his knees, begging God for forgiveness. So our second character, the tax collector, what, what do we know about him? He would least likely be found worshiping God, having faith in the kingdom of God. Tax collectors were known as thieves, as criminals, as cheaters. And a lot of times they were Gentiles, which means they were outside of God's promise. They were not Jewish people. And guess what? They were easily judged by everybody else, especially Pharisees. So here's what we notice about him in this text. Look at this. I think this is the most interesting part. Where is he? The tax collector stood at a distance. So you've got, if this is the temple, whatever that looks like, you've got the Pharisee who's here and he's like, God, thank you so much for who you are. I'm so good. I'm not like him. I want to prove to you how good I am. I've done all this. And then back here, not even willing to come up to the temple gate is the, Pharisee, is the tax collector. He stood at a distance. Why, y'all? Why was he at a distance? Because he did not feel worthy to approach even the temple where the spirit of God lived. Have you ever met somebody, known somebody, or maybe your story is you felt unworthy to come to church? Do you know how many people, yes, teenagers I talk to that say, man, I don't belong there. You can't handle what's going on in my life. Good thing is I don't have to. It's not my job. God does that. But I talk to people who are like, I feel unworthy to step into that building, unworthy to go to that service, unworthy to go to that group. Y'all might have friends who feel like they're not worthy to come to your group. And y'all, we don't want an environment where they feel that way, but that's what this dude was battling with. In the world's view of his life, he was the outcast. He was unworthy. Not only did he feel unworthy for the temple, but he also felt unworthy for who? God. It said he wouldn't even look up at heaven. I don't know about you, but I've felt that before in my life. You ever felt like, God, I don't even feel worthy enough to talk to you, much less look at you, much less realize that you're with me right now. Like, y'all, I've been in low moments in my life, sinful moments in my life, where, I don't know if you've ever been there, where, where, where the thought of God being present with me terrified me. It was like, if God really is here right now, wow, I'm embarrassed. 
And this is what that man feels. He's like, God, I don't know why I'm here. I can't even go to the gate. I can't even approach. I'm just on my knees begging for forgiveness. God, have mercy on me. Forgive me. What was he? Next slide. He was spiritually aware. So if pride is being spiritually blind, humility, because that's what you see here. I talked about it at the beginning, right? Embarrassment and humility go hand in hand, right? Why do we get embarrassed? Why, why do we get red in the face? Why do we get freaked out in those moments? Because we are humbled. Y'all know being embarrassed will humble you. I'm watching it happen with a three-year-old in my house. My daughter, even at three years old, knows when she messed up and she gets embarrassed. When I call that little girl out, she cannot handle getting in trouble. That is at the core of who we are. But what does that mean? That means if we feel that and experience that, what if we lean into that? Because the truth is, I believe in that moment, that is where God can work the most. Because humility, y'all listen, is really being aware of your brokenness. Humility is really being aware that you are helpless and that you need a savior and you could have never received Jesus the day that you did that if you're a Christian if you didn't have humility because you can't understand that you're broken and you can't do it by yourself until you are humbled. And some of y'all really experienced some humility being humbled in your life, much more than embarrassment. I'm talking about being humbled before a real God because God will use things in our life to humble us before his throne. Why? Because there's grace, healing, and forgiveness. So listen, when you feel shame and you feel guilt and you feel conviction, I wanna encourage you. Maybe you've heard this before. I love saying this. That is a good thing. Lean into that, y'all. When you feel that, don't run from it. God is not there to make you feel like you were horrible. God is there. Yes, there might be discipline. God is a parent. God is a father. He will discipline. But God is there to say, I love you. You are my child. Come home. So lean into that instead of running from it. The shame, the guilt, conviction. This man was broken before God. How often are you broken before God? Don't, don't answer that out loud, but I want you to think internally. How often are you broken before God? How often do you hit your knees? Humility will unpack the mess in your life, but it always allows healing. Hey, hey Anna, hold on for one minute. I'll tell, you, I'll tell you when to start playing. I'm so sorry. I apologize. My bad. She came up with the right cue. I want to keep going for a minute on something. Hang with me. This man was broken before God and humility will unpack the mess in your life. I don't know what kind of relationship you have with your parents, but for me, I had a really strong relationship with them. And I think often your relationship with God is reflected in your relationship with your parents or vice versa. And so if you have really terrible parents, if you have parents who don't like you, who are rude to you, who aren't saved, who aren't believers, who don't care about what you're doing at church, who talk down to you, who, 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 who say words they shouldn't say to you, you're probably going to have a harder time understanding that God loves you and is your father than somebody like me would because I had very loving parents who weren't perfect but were very great people who tried really hard. But I'll never forget one moment that I had when I was literally on the ground as a college student sobbing in front of my parents. Never thought I would have that moment in my life, especially as a young adult. And that moment in my mess, it rocked my world. Because it reminded me that if I can do that before my earthly parents, how much more can I do that before my heavenly father? When you, when you put humility in the equation, it unpacks what's going on. I want to give a different example. Okay, so... Uh, we've got a little holiday coming up, and whether you celebrate it or not, not celebrate, I don't like that word, whether you participate or not, um, you, you know the holiday, and, and we've seen it. Sorry if I have bad hat hair, okay? Don't judge me. But uh, my, wife, my, my daughter and I, we just started watching Scooby-Doo together, okay? Anybody like Scooby-Doo? Anybody, anybody here? Okay, y'all, that's old school, all right? Scooby-Doo is like from back in the day, okay? Um, that's like the classic original. They're making, I searched Scooby-Doo on YouTube TV. They had like 50 versions. I was like, what is this? Okay, let me get the original, all right? And we started watching it. What happens at the end of Scooby-Doo, right? They find somebody 
who, uh, who, who has a mask, all right? And, and we got that holiday coming up, and so people will put on masks. I don't know how this is going to work with a mic, but we'll find out. All right, so this is one of my masks. Does that sound weird? All right, I'll take it off. All right, so what do they do? They, they unmask the person at the end of the show, right? They, 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 they take the mask off, and, and what do we normally find? It's just, it's just an average an average human being. All right, let's, I got another one here. These are my favorite masks. I got some good masks, y'all, all right? Y'all ever see my old man mask? All right, check this out. What's up? How y'all doing? All right. I can do voices with them too. All right, all right. Y'all didn't hear the horse voice because uh, the mic was messing up. All right, I got, got one more. Hold on. This is my like, this is my, I did this one just because it's just kind of creepy. All right. I don't know what this is, but if this shows up at your house, I'm sorry, all right? I know where some of y'all live. All right, cool. So, so here's the deal. I also, have a, I also have a cat mask, all right? Anybody want this, by the way? It's, it's broken. I'm just curious. All right, I'll give it to you after. Okay. Y'all weird. Why do you want a cat mask? That's psycho. All right. Uh, here, here's the deal with masks, okay? Here's the deal with masks. I thought about with that holiday coming up and people all around the world celebrating it. You're going to see it everywhere for most of you, a lot of you. Humility will unmask the real you. Just like when they, when the Mystery Inc. gang comes in and they prove that this ghost is actually just a human being and they unmask underneath is, is just the person who was behind the charade, the facade. And when you let humility come into the equation. Come on up, Anna. You can come now. When you bring humility into the equation, it unmasks what's going on. And y'all, listen to me. Listen to me. Don't move. Here we go. I, I, I feel like you have a hard time, y'all right here, unmasking what's going on in your life because you don't want the real you to be seen. And we know that humility will expose but here's the deal, that exposing what is going on is saying, God, here's the truth. And I told you guys, here's my mask. I told you guys a few weeks ago that truth and light are the same. That where there is truth, there is light, and where there is light, there is truth. And so here's what I want to encourage you with tonight. Maybe you are like the Pharisee. And maybe you're worshiping either here or in the sense of like your daily walk with the Lord. And you got to get right. You got to unmask. You got to quit living a lie. And you got to in, enter some humility into your life to say, God, I'm honest before you. This is what I have going on. This is what I need you to take. This is what I need you to do. And maybe tonight you're like the tax collector. And guess what? God has changed your life, but you've come back to the throne again and you are so broken. Here's what I want to challenge you. Here's the only challenge I could think of, but I think it's the perfect challenge for you. If you're walking through the season and you've done the unmasking and you've done the exposing and you were before God, you can't even look him in the face, but you know God gives you grace and mercy and you're begging for it. I want to encourage you to keep going. Don't stop. Keep asking, keep knocking, keep seeking, keep trusting because God will answer yes, y'all. He will say yes. Would you pray with me? Would you close your eyes, bow your heads? Tonight, as there are two people in the story. There are two people in this room. And if the issue of pride is at the core of an evil heart, then humility must be at the core of a righteous heart. And so Jesus, right now, I pray over the teenagers here tonight who are gonna sing one more song and worship you. And I pray that you would work and move and you would unpack things, you would speak. God, you would lead, you would do what only you can do. You would heal, you would remind, you would encourage, you would lead. Jesus, we love you and we praise you. 
And so we're going to sing to you, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.